Western tanks, missiles and fighter jets. Without them, Kyiv says it has little hope of retaking territory occupied by Russian forces. But even in defence, the Ukrainian army already faces a more, much more fundamental problem. Finding ammunition to keep the weapons it already has firing. DW's Nick Connolly has been to the front lines in eastern Ukraine to find out how the so-called shell hunger is impacting the way this war is being fought. It takes many hands to load this Soviet howitzer, a weapon twice as old as the commander in charge of it. They have enough hands, but they're short on is ammunition, and they're being outgunned. Ukraine's defense minister says the Russian army is firing four times more shells. It's time to move. It's pretty overcast. It doesn't stop the Russian drones from seeing us, but it makes it a bit more difficult and gives us a bit more time to talk to people in these positions that, in theory, are obviously a target for Russian strikes. This Soviet-era Grad rocket artillery system is far from cutting-edge technology. But with a range of 40 kilometers, it can fire over the heads of the Ukrainian infantry in the trenches ahead and hold off Russian attacks. That makes these units a prime target for the Russian army. This is Vadim's seventh grad of this war. My last grad was like a piece of Swiss cheese at the end. Loads of holes from shrapnel. Kept on going till the chassis conked out. And yet the grads are less of a problem than the lack of ammunition. Ukraine has used up decades worth of stocks in a year. Kiev and its allies are now scouring Europe and beyond for more. Just the other week, we used up all our ammunition. We had nothing. We couldn't do anything for four days. Ammunition scarcity affects us all. We desperately need shells. We have a counter-offensive ahead of us. How are we going to protect our infantry? Are we going to throw sticks at the Russians instead? As we leave Vadim and his grad, we see this, a special vehicle used to tow away stranded tanks. They're a common sight here. This is where Ukrainian army mechanics fight to keep museum-age tanks going. Dmitro shows us what shrapnel can do. This wasn't even a direct hit. It came from a shell that landed meters away. The entire turret will now have to be replaced. Not something they can do here. Most of the time, we're replacing seals, pumps, dealing with oil leaks. These tanks are old. They're being used much more intensively than anyone ever expected. They're just knackered. The people we meet have been closely following news of Western battle tanks reaching Ukraine, but they're not expecting to see leopards or challengers here anytime soon. There simply aren't enough of them. I'm convinced we'll finish this war fighting with Soviet kit. There just isn't enough new Western technology to go around. Sledgehammers, crowbars and welding machines. That's what's going to get us through. Improvised parts made by hand out of scrap are the order of the day. Factory-built spares are the exception. Dimitro tells us his unit regularly sends teams across the country to Kherson, where they're still finding Russian armor almost half a year after Moscow's army was kicked out. Tank ammunition like this is a bonus. Some carry insulting messages left by Russian crews. They didn't get a chance to fire that at us. Well, they'll get these back soon enough. For all the news of Western military support, it's Russia that's inadvertently keeping these Ukrainian units in ammunition. And these men say they couldn't do without it. And our Kiev correspondent Nick Connolly filed that report and he joins me now here in the studio for a change. Welcome back to home base, uh, uh, Nick. Um, so this so-called shell hunger, how, what kind of effect uh, does that have on the day-to-day -day fighting? I mean, it's fundamental. When you talk to people off camera, they say, were it not for this lack of ammunition, they could have probably taken back Donetsk already. I mean, that's their kind of subjective... Is it that analysis. bad? 
Well, it's basically, you know, right now they're being outgunned four to one by the Russians. In terms of what they could fire if they had you know, maximum supplies, they could do five, six times more. I think it's just also very different from morale, right? If you're sitting under constant fire and you're having to kind of weigh up every shell that you, you know, send back, yeah. it just makes you feel very vulnerable. And it's the kind of extraordinary thing that the more complex, expensive stuff like the equipment is actually in better supply than the ammunition to go with it. Well, in your report, we saw Ukrainian soldiers using uh, Russian ammunition that they uh, got their hands on. It's very uh, firing it back at them. Uh, how ironic is that? Well, it's extraordinary. I mean, we thought that the Russian retreat from Kherson last autumn was actually quite controlled and organised, but it seems like they abandoned huge amounts of tech in place like that, and it's still being found. The only actually break with bottleneck is actually having enough uh, demining experts to make sure that it's safe to go in and take, strip down the spare parts, strip off the ammunition. Um, but it is just the fact that Russia has been building up stockpiles of these ammunitions for decades, and Ukraine really started off the war with pretty low supplies, and it's now just playing catch up all the time. It's always on the back foot having to compensate for this lack of ammunition. Mm. Now, the US uh, uh, has just announced more support for Ukraine, much of which is to be spent on ammo. Uh, last month, European countries signed a deal to provide $2 billion worth of ammunition to Ukraine. Is that going to be enough and is, there going, is it going to get there in time? Well, this is interesting. If you look at what the Americans have been doing, they've basically refused all the Ukraine demands for more high-tech stuff, planes. They say, if you don't have ammunition, you don't need planes. You know, back to basics has been basically their message all along. I think it's a question of timing. Right now, the Americans have been sending stuff that they have already produced for themselves rather than waiting for it to be manufactured. But lots of Western NATO countries are saying, we don't have the capacity to give more of our stuff that we already have. We're going to have to pay money to our manufacturers. And then sometime in the future, six, nine months down the line, you might get it. But the question is capacity. Do they really have enough manufacturing capacity to produce enough? Well, recently, we had the French saying they would send 2,000 shells a month to Ukraine, which if you compare it to, you know, five, 6,000, uh, yeah, allegedly being fired every day, it's, it's just peanuts. Yeah, indeed it is. Uh, now, Ukrainians in, in occupied Russian territory have been warned to get themselves to safety. Uh, can that be read as a sign that a counteroffensive is on the way? I'm always a bit kind of cautious with these public announcements. Last summer, we had lots of talk about Kherson being the main target, and then we saw the Ukrainians moving to Kharkiv first. I think definitely they're under pressure to show some results. They're worried that the Western countries that are supporting Ukraine right now are going to grow tired if they don't show that they are winners, that they can do this. Um, but in terms of the timings, I think we have to be very careful uh, to kind of expect anything too soon because they are still building up reserves. Uh, Nick, while I have you here uh, in Berlin, you've been covering this war from the outset. Um, what's your general feeling? How is it going in the defence of the Ukrainians of their country? I mean, I think Ukraine's done better than anyone expected, right? Everyone was expecting Definitely, Kiev yes. was going to collapse in three days. You know, Western intelligence, German intelligence gave them zero chances. I think the question is, what is success? What is a win for Ukraine? Is it sending the Russians back to where they were on 24th February last year? Is it getting back Crimea? I think that is kind of difficult. And I think the Ukrainian government itself doesn't really know what it sees as the kind of end goal for now. But for now, Ukraine is holding up. People are still going to fight. They're not having to be forced to fight in large numbers. And, you know, Western help is actually finally picking up after more than a year. Finally, these deliveries are happening more regularly on a bigger scale. So I think most Ukrainians are fairly confident that they can keep going you know, maybe another year or so at least. Our key correspondent, Nick Connolly, there in the studio. Thank you very much, Nick.